listening to the Right Right Podcast, Season 2, Episode 1. Hello, and welcome to Season 2 of the Right Right Podcast, your weekly pep talk on living the writing life. I'm Elon. I'm John. I'm Craig. And today we're going to be talking about when voice beats grammar. Um, and this was your idea, John, so I'm just going to hand it to you to explain what you mean. All right. Well, there are times when editing can strip the unique voice of story or character. So I thought that it would be great for us to explore where the line is. Um, is there a definitive, definitive, identifiable moment wherein it's right or wrong to edit out voice or not? Um, this has come up a lot for me uh, when I've been editing. And I think for writers in general, um, sometimes you have to figure out, uh, you know, you might be breaking a certain rule of grammar because, uh, you know, you have a character that might have a certain accent or a way of speaking uh, that would break a rule of grammar. So I thought it would be great for us to all talk about how we've encountered it as writers today. Yeah, that sounds great. Um so as a writer, I actually struggle a lot with this. Um, in my first drafts, my characters tend to all sound the same. Um, and it takes me a while to figure out how to give them unique voice without relying on like cheap tricks like uh, vocal tics. Uh, for instance, one of my favorite book series of all time is The Wheel of Time. And yeah. the characters in it, it's it's problematic that... You know, you've got Matt who always says blood and bloody ashes. You've got Perrin mm -hmm. who has his own vocal tics. You have uh, these characters who are differentiated in their dialogue by repeating idiomatic expressions, uh, which I don't think is a very effective way to do things because it makes their dialogue seem flat. Did you have that experience reading that book? Uh, well, yeah, I... You know, I I greatly enjoyed the Wheel of Time books, uh, but uh, yeah, like looking stepping back, having read other things since then, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, you're right. The, but for example, I'm thinking of the character Swan Sanche, where she always used fishing metaphors. Yeah, <laughs> and that, it's examples like that that okay, you know, we're in her POV when we read that. Um, but there are subtler ways um, to uh, convey voice. And I think if you read a lot of general fiction, um, in it, you know, you don't need to resort to these very um, punctuated, almost cartoony um, extremes to show that it's, it's uh, someone's uh, worldview coming across. Uh, although that said, I mean, if somebody did grow up uh, on the docks or in a, you know, in a fishing life, uh, it's more, yeah, it's likely they might have they might make a lot of fishing metaphors, but that's not going to define them as a person. I think voice is a lot subtler and, and it's, it really takes a lot of digging into the intuitive part of character to figure out um, how you convey voice. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the hardest parts of writing that there is. <laughs> so does that happen? Uh, you know, like the Swan Sanche moment you bring up is actually really relevant because those things happen in dialogue and in narration. Um, and it flattens her as a character in a lot of ways um, because she's had extensive global experience and relies solely on her youth to, uh, to frame her reality. Um, right. and, and so I just finished reading a book that I thought was excellent called uh, The Motion of Puppets um, by... Kevin Donahue, I hope I got that right, um, where, I'll spoil it for you here, but um, the protagonist and his wife become separated when his wife uh, is transformed into a puppet. Um, and then the POV starts to switch between the two characters as they're looking for each other or experiencing life as a puppet. And the tone that the wife's character, her name is Kay, takes on as a puppet shifts dramatically. Um, you get her perception changing. Things start to uh, move differently in her in her eyes, and um, it grows more and more apparent as the book goes on that her perspective on reality has shifted. Um, and the other character is an academic, and 
all of the chapters, all of the sequences in his point of view um, have much longer sentences. They have different grammatical structures. He's using longer words. Even though it's all narration and it's third person, um, you feel like you're riding closer behind the head of one character or the other. Right. Uh, yeah, I I think a lot of writers get, when they think of voice, they get caught up in dialogue. And like you're making a good point there, it's much more than just dialogue. And that's where it starts to get really tricky. Um, with a sci-fi novel I've been working on for, well, far too long, um, I've tried to make that worldview and that voice come out in the narration as well. So if, like, uh, I've got a character that's always sort of paranoid and wanting to hold on to power. And that's easy to come across in dialogue, but you need to make it come out in the narration as well. And that comes out in how they view the world around them, how they respond to things, um, you know, the feelings that come up. Uh, so it is much more than just voice, like you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I, I, I've heard another podcast uh suggest an exercise where you buy uh, whereby you describe the same thing from different points of view um, which i think is a wonderful exercise for discovering character voice because you know uh, a small room to a claustrophobic person probably looks very different to someone who uh, really enjoys enclosed spaces um, mm -hmm. they'll probably notice different things describe them very differently they'll have a uh, different mood um, and even if it's narration, those things can come out and build a character in a reader's mind. Yeah. And I, I just want to say that, um, cause you mentioned, or Craig, you're sort of describing narration and voice almost as different things, but like what you're describing actually is voice. Voice is this very large, all encompassing thing. And it's really, how do you tell your story? Uh, and that, that's kind of what it covered. You, you know, you could think of voice like music. Um, you know, and your, your story you're telling is like a musical piece. So the narration is a part of that, just as dialogue is. So the way that a character is going to speak and if they're the point of view character and let's say you're telling it in third person and it's their point of view, um, then what you say, what you choose to say or what you choose not to say, how you say it, that all covers uh, voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess the point to hammer home is it's more than just dialogue. Yeah, voices, you know, the entire book, how is it presented? When when I read something and and I'll, I'll say, wow, I love the voice, it's not just how people are speaking, it's how everything reads, what's left out, what's added, um, how, how are the sentences shaped in a sense? You know, like, do you have, um, so you might have some uh, antagonists, they might have the antagonist as... Um, a point of view character and they could be say like a kind of Hannibal Lecter type character <laughs> and really, really smart and clever and evil. And you know, their sentences are long and meticulous. There's semicolons, colons, parentheses, just everything's like a work of art. Just like you feel like you're reading the work of a brilliant person. Um, you could have a character written um, or a character who is a five-year-old boy narrating something and there might be sentence fragments and sometimes words that are used improperly the way you would expect a five-year-old to narrate their experience of the world and to me that's voice and i think that's a really tricky thing for <clears throat> authors to write from a kid's point of view mm -hmm. because quite often the through the narration the author inserts insights that a kid wouldn't necessarily have that's right yeah and that's part of voice too mm -hmm. you know what what you know, making sure voice is consistent is as important as the voice itself, because uh, they call that an authorial intrusion when uh, when what happens is suddenly it's not the story anymore. And you feel like the author has just crept in and it's like, hey, I'm here. I'm doing this. And you don't want that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I want to go back to a thing you just described because it sort of brings us back to the focus of the episode. Um, which is using sentence fragments or using words incorrectly, this notion of grammatical mistakes as voice. And when, and like you said, when you introduced the topic, where is that line? And as an editor with your experience, where do you draw the line editing out uh, grammatical mistakes or leaving them in for the purpose of maintaining character voice? Well, I can give a, a really good example um, from 
something that I worked on recently. So, in fact, the author and I had a few rounds of back and forth, these very long comments <laughs> in, the, in the margin uh, before we ar arrived at a decision. It was all over the use of one word. So the, the actual passage was, he was getting real warm. Now, grammatically, it should be, he was getting really warm. But the point of view character is a Texan cop. And in terms of the way a Texan would say that sentence, it, it would be, he was getting real warm, you know, that, that kind of accent. And so that was the correct voice. And the author and I agreed about that, but we were concerned about there are, there are many times reviewers on Amazon and Goodreads who will, doesn't matter how good the story is, if there's grammar problems in, you know, quotation marks, uh, they, they will complain without specifying what they are. So, you know, the concern is we don't want to get the grammar, um, you know, like the, yeah, the grammar police after us. That hurts so, me so much because it means that they're not, these reviewers aren't paying attention. Like, yeah, and that's exactly it. In the end, that was my argument to the author. And we agreed on that point, and we kept it true to the voice mm -hmm. that the, those reviewers will be by far outnumbered by the reviewers who, in a sense, get it. Yeah, um, if those people reviewed Faulkner, they would say that it was written by an illiterate person. And granted, that's an exception to the rule because no one hmm. else can do what he did with language. But... Um, you have to sort of look beyond the mechanical structure to find um, something that really does express story. Because that's the point here. The point isn't to be a meticulously perfect essay, um, unless you're writing nonfiction. And even then, there's probably room for grammatical flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's just very interesting. And for what it's worth, not that I want to like... Uh, get on an even higher soapbox right now but i feel like capitulating to a potential reviewer um is it it, it has a it has a chance to to take your passion out of your story um mm -hmm. and so i always like when writers say write what you want to read and worry about everybody else later uh, because it's definitely the truth. Like the stuff that I've written, um, I I read it because I like what happens in it. Um, the same was true for me when I was a musician in college. I would mm -hmm. listen to my own albums a lot, and I didn't feel like a self-centered jerk for doing it. I just enjoyed the music because I was making the stuff that I liked. Um, yeah, is it should? I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely just uh, rambling and. I, I, it's good I rambling. Should, I, I should just become some kind of uh, member of the clergy at this point. <laughs> uh, but you do make a good point because if you write to make everybody happy, chances are you're going to have a very bland book mm -hmm. at the end of it. Um, you have to write for for your target audience, and ideally, you are part of your target audience. Because um, I think it's Robert J. Sawyer that says when you get reviews on your book, it should be a bunch of fives and ones because that means you're hitting your target audience. If you have a bunch of two to four with a lot of them in the threes, then that means you're trying to please everybody and you have a very bland book and the response most people have is, meh, it was okay. Whereas really you want that really passionate response, whether they love it or they hate it. So writing for yourself and your target audience is a thing to do. Mm-hmm. That brings to mind a book, just before we take our quick break for our uh, recommended reading, um, there's a series called The uh, Broken Empire by Mark Lawrence, and it's a very polarizing series because it's a little disturbing, but the people who love it, myself among them, absolutely love it because the characters are so raw. Um, he's done such a fantastic job of injecting these ruthless, barbarous killers onto the page um and you know he he throws you all the way into the deep end of this these violent abhorrent people and then pulls you back through their past to give you a bit of context um and so there's a lot of reviews that are one star that just say i couldn't get through the first chapter mm -hmm. um but the series is fantastic Anyway, so we're going to break for our uh, recommended reading. John, you have this week's recommendation. Right, yeah. And, and this this book was 
kind of the inspiration behind this uh, this topic for our podcast today. Um, it's, it's called Story Trumps Structure by Stephen James. Uh, amazing book. I mean, the what he it's it's definitely a uh, a pantser's best friend. So a pantser being for those that aren't familiar with the term, when you make your writing up as you go rather than planning it all out. And what he does is he talks about how he talks about various techniques on how you can um, just connect to the story and that the structure comes from that naturally rather than, you know, following like a three act structure with all your different parts. Um, and one of the topics in there is about how um, voice is the uh, you know, voice is sort of kind of like how story is the is the thing you should connect to and out of that comes structure well voice is the thing you should connect to and out of that um, comes everything else you know whether it's, it's it's perfect grammar or whether you might break some rules of grammar um, you know um, so I, I definitely recommend this for um, writers who want to uh, you know consume all these different craft books that will change how you write and give you different ideas um, I definitely found it to be a very um, a very different approach to the craft of writing. Um, so yeah, that's, that is my recommendation. Awesome. So that recommendation is story Trump's structure by Stephen James, and we'll put a link to it in the liner notes for the episode. Um, mm. So I want to use the second half of the episode to talk more about the mechanics of this, because we've talked a lot about the theory. Um, we've talked a lot about our opinion on voice, but mechanically speaking, um, there's a very simple uh, example that you can look at in probably any book that features characters who speak. Um, and that is that people do not speak using the same prescriptive rules that apply to writing. Um, people often make mistakes. People often end sentences and prepositions. There's just so many things that people do when they sound natural and they're speaking like themselves um, that just break the rules. Um, and if you ever read something, I'm sure, uh, you know, John and Craig, you've probably read something like this. I know I have, uh, where characters who, characters who shouldn't speak with perfect grammar, um, and it really throws me off. Mm. Have you guys had that experience? Uh, you mean where a character who shouldn't speak with perfect grammar does because the, uh, author chose to go with perfect grammar? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think that, again, is like writing from the perspective of a child. Um, quite often, they speak perfect English in books, and they have, like I said before, incredible insights that kids shouldn't have. Um, so that's probably the most obvious example that I see more than once. It happens quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, before we... Act, so I, I, that doesn't really broker much depth because it's it's fairly straightforward i mean the sentences that i'm using right now are fairly broken um and if if they were perfect this would sound much more stilted um and i would probably sound robotic uh so i guess we can also talk about differentiating voice craig before we hit record you were talking about an experience you had reading a book uh where you couldn't tell the characters apart can you go into that a little bit yeah, for sure. I was uh, reading a uh, MM romance uh, for people not into the lingo. That's male, male romance or gay romance. Um, and it was told from the perspective of the two male leads, alternating chapter to chapter between the two uh, guys. And I honestly, for the entire novel, could not keep straight who was who. No pun intended on the straight. Um, <laughs> but like the... They were different characters and they had different interests. Um, so for me, that was a bit of a signpost of who is who. But still, like I would read a chapter and I'm like, whose POV am I in? And so I'd have to go back to the start of the chapter to see the chapter heading, to see the name of the character whose POV I'm in. And then even then I had to think back, OK, in the very first chapter, which character was it that liked this and which character was it that said that and it took a lot of thinking and at the halfway through the book I gave up on trying to keep it sorted who was who and I just read the book 
not really caring who was who because I could not keep it organized in my head because there was no differentiation at all between the two characters and their voices. Yeah, that's that's an excellent example. We are actually right at time. So do either of you have any final thoughts on this topic uh, before I give our listeners um, a writing slash research prompt? I guess I would I would say uh, with all that we've talked about, because we've really we've really given the idea of voice having the voice being the one that you um, I'm looking for a word. I can't find it. Prioritize? <laughs> Prioritize over grammar. That is by no means um, an excuse to be ignorant of grammar. Um, you know, just like a master painter should know all the techniques before they break any rules. As a writer, you should always be aware of grammar. And if you're ever going to break it, know exactly why. Um, because, um, Ilan, as you had mentioned, um, you, I think you, you mentioned Faulkner uh, as an example. I mean, uh, some writers can get away with um, with some um, <laughs> features of grammar, um, but it shouldn't be done just for the sake of it of art. It should have a purpose, and that should purpose should be for voice. And I'd like to just jump in quickly and say that there is a bit of a balance. Um, you do want your voice to sound realistic, but at the same time, you don't want to write word for word how people talk in real life because it would be a disaster on the page yeah, like um, ums and pauses yeah and then also people interject sentences within their own sentences i've received emails from someone who writes exactly how they speak and i have to read it like six times to understand what they're saying you know that actually brings to mind something that is it's kind of an ironic connection to your recommended book john uh a lot of the transcripts of conversations with uh, United States President-elect Donald Trump mm -hmm. are written exactly as he answers questions. And he often just has like three sentences going at the same time. They're not connected to each other. And it's almost impossible to parse on the page. It's I mean, it's equally difficult to uh, understand as he's talking as he's talking. But yeah, when you see it written, you're like, wow, this is not human speech. Um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's as far into politics as we'll get. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> to, to close out the episode, I actually have a prompt for you all. And that is to consider your favorite character from a recent book you read. Um, and, and think about what about the writing made that character stand out. Uh, if you read a line of dialogue from them or a chapter from their perspective, would you be able to tell if it was them without character attribution? So take a moment that you like or a moment that you found particularly, uh, you know, memorable and comb over it very closely. Look at word choice, look at sentence length, look at structure and other things that give you the essence of that character and see if you can pull those things out if the character is feels the same to you. And that wraps up our episode, uh, season two, episode one. Thank you for joining the new Right Right podcast. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.